Today I'm going to talk to you about system calls inside of Rust and inside the RISC-V architecture. So if you look at your screen, what I've shown you right now is the trap handler that we wrote a couple of months ago. And inside this trap handler is our funnel for all the different asynchronous and synchronous interrupts that we can have. So if we click over here to the RISC-V privilege specification, we can see that if the interrupt is one, it's an asynchronous interrupt. If the interrupt is zero, it's a synchronous interrupt. And we can see that one of the synchronous interrupts that we care about is eight. That's an environment call from U mode. So environment calls are what RISC-V call your system calls. So a special instruction E call, E-C-A-L-L, causes the CPU to stop what it's doing, jump over to the met machine trap vector, which is a function that you write in the kernel, that you've written in the kernel. <laughs> and if you don't remember, it brings us to this right here. M trap stands for machine trap. And then what I do is once again, we check to see if it's an asynchronous system call. And remember, if it's not, means it's a synchronous trap down here. We're looking at number eight. So here's a match statement in Rust. Remember, it just matches cause underscore num with whatever number we give it. And if we take a look at the spec once again, we can see that number eight is the environment call from U mode. So if you're not familiar with it, U mode is the user mode. S mode is your supervisor mode and machine mode is your machine mode. M mode is your machine mode. There you go. So in that case, U mode is your least privileged. Supervisor sits somewhere in the middle. And then machine mode is your most privileged. So in machine mode, we can execute any instruction. The MMU is turned off. So we can do whatever we want with that. Supervisor mode is essentially machine mode, except we have an MMU. So that's turned on now. So if we wanted to access external memory, it's hard to program the MMU when the MMU is turned on. That's essentially what I'm trying to say there. So anytime we take a trap, we the CPU will immediately elevate into machine mode. Now there are ways where we could delegate certain interrupts into either supervisor mode or some lesser mode. But I take them all in machine mode and then I delegate them out to the kernel to wherever it needs to go. For now, we're not doing that. We just care about the system calls that we're going to be doing. So that's why we have the option of doing an environment call from S mode, which is number nine. The reason is, is because say we're in S mode and we want to map in the MMU. Well, we it's hard to do it when the MMU is turned on because if we go to an external uh, memory location and try to write page tables in there, well, we're going to page fall. And that will immediately get us to M mode. We'll get a page fall in kernel mode, which is not good. And so what we're doing instead is we take all traps in machine mode, and then we decide whether we need to delegate to S mode or delegate to U mode. Typically, we will never delegate to U mode. The only time we ever jump into U mode is whenever we're running a process. We're not there yet. So before we can actually handle processes, a process cannot write directly to the console. Because once again, the, the MMU is turned on. Now we can give it access to the UART driver that we wrote a long time ago, but we really don't want to do that because if we gave it the access to it, it could do whatever it wants. It could reset the UART, it could change the bit width, that sort of stuff. So instead we're going to add a, a system call that is for write and read. That way there we can read from the console, we could write to the console and do stuff like that. And it's not going to be very robust in the beginning. But as you can see what I've done here is eight and nine are those two that we care about. One is environment call from system mode, or from user mode, and one is from supervisor mode. So in user mode, we're going to call this external function called do underscore syscall. Now if we open this up, we'll see we have syscall right here. And that's going to lead us to here. Now there's nothing really in here yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as we write user processes and we find a need, we're going to add a system call. Now you pretty much can already think of some of the system calls we already need. Read, write, so that we can read and write to the console. Exit, so that we can actually deschedule our process. And certain things like that. Fork, well, we might not need a fork. That's if you want to program a Unix type system where you want to fork off a different process, but we'll see. We'll see where we go from there. So we'll start writing some processes after this and see which system calls we actually need. That way there, this number doesn't get too big. So a lot of times they will create a table. And in that table, we have a number, comma, and then some sort of function pointer. In there, we have to have a function for every single one of the system calls that we have. Uh, I used a match statement in Rust. It's up to you. If you want to use a table and then match the table, that's fine. Or just use a match statement like me. So a match statement, remember, is like a switch statement. So in whenever it gets compiled, if you ever think of the switch statement in C or C++ and stuff like that, a lot of times it turns into a jump table anyway. And so why complicate the issue? I don't know. It's up to you, whatever you want to do. But typically, zero. I use for exit because that's the lowest number that we have available to us. We really don't want to get into the negative numbers because everything is unsigned here. 
but that that's up to you. So the system call number can be anything. So let's take a look at the ABI. So ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. And that essentially tells us, okay, how is a program going to do it? So if we look up eCall here, uh, that means I gotta navigate while on camera. That's fun, right? So the, oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So look, eCall is sitting right there. So eCall stands for the environment call. And once again, essentially what happens is as soon as we get an eCall, the CPU will stop what it's doing and will not execute the next instruction. In fact, MEPC, which is the machine, machine exception program counter, it's a register that stores here's what caused this issue. That MEPC will actually be the memory address of the eCall instruction. Notice that this encoding of the eCall has nothing to do with, it has no source register, so it's zero. It has nothing in there. So how do we tell the CPU or how do we tell our kernel what system call we want to access. Well, we use an ABI almost like a calling convention in C or C++. So in RISC-V, we have eight argument registers, A0 through A7. And so what I've chosen to do is we use A0 as both the system call number and the return value. So if you think about how C++ interfaces with assembly, we can use A0 as our first parameter. A stands for argument, so it's our first argument as well as the first return value that we can have. So RISC-V allows for two, the ABI allows for two, so A0, A1 could be two different data points that we return back. But if you remember back to the old C style, we only re usually return one anyway. It's either a memory address or some sort of value. Now all the registers are 64 bits, so it could be an unsigned long or whatever we want it to be. So um, everything inside the kernel, we have not done floating point yet, and hopefully we won't have to. So typically implementing floating point in a kernel is not a good idea. However, our emulator has hardware, quote unquote, hardware float support for both single and double precision. So if we wanted to use that, we could. But in this case, we're going to use A0 to, to, to delegate our system call number. So just like any C++ function, before we make a function call, which is C-A-L-L -L instead of E-C-A-L-L, -L, we set up our register. So A0 gets the value of the first argument. Well, in this case, it's going to be the system call number. Then what we do is we set A1, A2, A3, all the way through A7 with the parameters that need to be there. So if you think about exit, exit needs one parameter, which is the exit number. And it's just basically a, how did this exit? If it's zero, it means it succeeded. If it's non-zero, it's an error code or something like that. So typically the exit system call is going to be zero. So zero would go into A0 and then A1 would contain the exit number. And we could do that. So as you can see right now, I've just extracted out the system call number. Now this is the weird part that I actually made a mention of in the blog post. So in the let syscall underscore number, as you can see, we don't set it equal to anything. And so Rust sort of delegates the symbol, but doesn't actually link anything to it. Because remember, when we compile this, we can actually foreshadow what's going to happen. It's not like we're running this at the time when we compile it. So as you can see, the reason I did this is because whenever I do unsafe open brace, close brace, I'm creating a new scope. And I want syscall number to be outside of that scope so we can use the match statement on line 14. And if I didn't do this with the let on the outside, now with the let on the outside, I can constrain it to a U size or something like that. However, Rust, knowing that it has, okay, I'll lazily evaluate line nine, the let statement. And then it goes to line 12 and says, hey, look, I knew I was going to lazily evaluate syscall underscore number, and now he's using it right here. So let's see what dereference of frame dot regs 10 is. Now the reason we have to put this in unsafe is because we're dereferencing a raw pointer, which is a trap frame. So if you remember back to whenever we got into the trap frame, a trap frame contains all the separate registers. Whenever we make an e-call, we want to preserve the absolute integrity of a process. If we change one register and you're not expecting it, you're going to execute thinking that register had the previous value, not whatever register or not whatever value you changed it to. So in this case, what we can do is if you look at the ABI, actually, I guess I could pull it up, but let's see, let's pull it up here. Here's the specification. So the actual specification, if we went down to the assembler programmer's handbook, you can see AX10. So here's all the register numbers, 0 through 31. So that's 32 total registers. This is the ABI name. I always use the ABI name because I'm trying to stay consistent with the ABI. ABI, once again, is the application binary interface. And it just says, here's what we recommend you used. And so if everybody uses the same ABI, everybody is consistent. The return address is always the return address, the stack pointer. And the reason they chose this is because for the compressed instructions, which we haven't used, which are 16-bit instructions, you have to stay, I can't remember what it is now, but you have to stay on the lower order 
so 0 through 10, 16, or something like that. I don't, I don't remember. But that's why they have this sort of stuff. It must be 11. Must be. Don't quote me on that. Now, I want to go check. But I'm also recording a video, so I don't want to go check. Still want to check. Okay, screw it. I'm not going to check. But anyway, <laughs> just know that the reason they set these up this way is because when we have compressed instructions, we have to stick to the lower order of the instructions. So that means we don't have as many save. That's why save registers are split S2, S, I'm pointing to the screen as if you can see me point to the screen, but you can't. So S2, S11, you don't have with a compressed instruction. If you wanted to use that, you have to use the full 32-bit instruction. Temporaries T3 through T6, if you wanted to use those, you'd have to use the full instruction as well. So there we go. This is the ABI that we're going to use in our system calls. And so notice that X10 is a zero. That's why I can go into here and we know that arrays are zero based indexed and the registers are also zero based indexed. So register zero, that sort of stuff. So we have a five bit encoding field inside of all of our instructions for the registers, sources, destinations, things like that. And that five bits is two to the fifth, which is 32. It allows us to have zero through 31. Those are the range of numbers we can have with a five bit field. And in there, X10, once again, is our A0. And once again, we're going to use A0 as the system call number. So now I have extracted off the system call number. So if you remember back to the trap frame, the user is going to set up A0 and put whatever system call number they want. And then they're going to use E call, which immediately stops what it's doing, jumps to our trap vector. Remember what our trap vector does. It grabs everything off the CPU and saves it into that processes trap frame, which essentially means stores it in memory. So then because it just grabbed everything off and put it onto that trap frame, we could actually go back to the trap frame. We can't go to the CPU because now it's executing our kernel instructions. So now we have to go back to memory where we stored it and download X10, which is the 10th register A0. And so that is a way where we can actually return stuff. So if we wanted to return something for exit or something like that, I don't know why we would, but by the way, this would have to be inside of an unsafe context. So this is mutable. So I made the trap frame mutable. That way there we can change it. Equals 10. So essentially, remember what we said. We're going to use A0 to return a value. So if we ever schedule this process, what we're going to do is we're going to take the trap frame from memory, stick it on the CPU. So what did X10, which is A0, just become? Well, it just became 10. That's how we're going to return information back as well. And so system calls are, there's really no big deal to them. It's just another type of trap, but we get to specify how all these numbers are going to work. Now for now, we don't have anything because until we get processes, there really is no point to a system call because if we're in privilege mode, we have access to everything anyway. And a system call forces a context switch. So it's kind of a slow process. And so we're going to use uh, system calls just for user mode. And we haven't really gotten into user mode yet, but we can't do anything until we have system calls. And so I debated on whether I should do processes first and then system calls, but I can't even show you a process until we can deschedule it. I guess I could have shown you an infinite loop. And you'd have been like, yay, awesome, infinite loop. But this way here, I could actually create a system call, write and read, and pass it a pointer to a memory location. We could actually see something printed to the screen. Maybe, hopefully. That's the goal anyway, okay? So there you have it, that is system calls. It's no big deal. Once again, let's just recap what happens. In a system call, I'll be in user mode. Set the system call number to A0, all the parameters A1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way through 7. And then I use E call. Remember, E call is a special instruction in RISC V, halts what it's doing, goes to the machine trap vector. We elevate privileges up to machine mode. We go to that M trap. If you remember that, we go to that M trap and the M trap looks at number eight, which was the user mode E call. And mode eight or number eight will lead us to do underscore syscall. Now I like to have a nice pristine where we don't have it. As you can see, M trap is kind of dirty because we have all the trap vectors in there, but I'm delegating these up to different functions in there. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to download X10, which is A0, so I can get my system call number. And once again, if we want to return data, we can just modify whatever X10 is. So remember, the calling conventions say that any of the T registers, which stands for temporary, or any of the A registers, which stands for argument, we're allowed to change. So whenever the user types ECALL, -L, they need to expect that the next instruction, all the A registers and all the T registers are no longer what they put in there. And so we're allowed to modify those whenever we return back. Now let's take a look at line 17. The reason we do MEPC plus four is because the machine exception program counter tells us the address of the offending instruction. 
If you think back to it, eCall, the offending instruction, is the eCall instruction. So if we were to return MEPC and just jump back to the MEPC, that would be the eCall. And we just execute eCall, 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 over and over again. And the reason we have to control the MEPC is, number one, to get past the eCall. But think of exit. So 17, line 17, MEPC plus 4 for exit is not correct. Instead, what we need to do is we need to call the scheduler, get a new process, and return its MEPC and trap frame, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things that we need to consider that we probably don't know about yet until we get to processes. And there you have it. That's system calls. Thanks for watching.